Let's give her a warm welcome. Hi. Okay. By a quick show of hands, how many people in this room have introduced somebody to the concept of a resource-based economic model and, as a result, you received a response of sincere gratitude from the person. You were told, thank you for sharing this with me. Okay, good. Well, I don't know how many of you have actually shared. How many of you have, have shared this with other people? Okay, so not everyone has received that response. But hopefully, I'm, I'm gonna help you out with that. So now, how many people may have received feedback uh, at all similar to this note of gratitude? I'm gonna read to you. I just want to thank you for posting the Facebook status. Wake up, you ignorant sheeples, before we all die. <laughs> Followed by 11 exclamation points, because if you hadn't done that, myself, my wife, and two children might not have watched the 14 YouTube links you posted in the two hours following that, and thus discovered this new resource-based economic paradigm, information that has been life-changing for us. I shudder to think that if your status had been typed in lowercase letters instead of all caps, we might still be in the dark today about solutions that offer encouraging possibilities to all mankind. So, I don't think any of you identify with that. Fortunately, and this is not a real post, but unfortunately it was modeled after some people's real posts. No one here, I'm sure. And I bring this up as an extreme example of how our strategy for communicating information has a direct impact on whether or not someone is open to considering the information you have to offer. And I bring this up as an extreme example to illustrate uh, that in particular. Uh, and what's, even though this is nothing new, that the way you communicate makes a difference, as a U.S. coordinator, one of the most frequent questions I am asked by people is, how do I communicate this information in a way that my friends and relatives and coworkers will be more likely to receive it? So I've been invited to offer some advice to perhaps optimize your communication strategy, which I offer to you in six parts. Part one is adjusting your expectations. So when, when trying to contribute to an evolution, you have to consider a major component that has been prevalent in our own existing evolution up until now. And that is that the, a component that humans have a history of exhibiting symptoms of, and that is neophobia. Uh, actually, not this kind, um, a different kind. And by that, I, I mean, the fear of new things or experiences. And as a related condition, there's a related condition also called uh, the status quo bias, which is very similar to that. And so I'm sure you have experience with people who are exhibiting both neophobia and perhaps a status quo bias. So neophobia, fear of new things or experiences, status quo bias, a cognitive bias for the status quo. In other words, people tend not to change an already established behavior. They tend to go with default programming. And traditionally, this fear of new things is somewhat indigenous to our human limbic system, which is related to our emotion and memory mind and has been helpful in keeping us in an evolutionary sense from an early demise as a result of eating unfamiliar berries that might be poisonous. Yet, as we're discovering, it has been, it has been decidedly unhelpful when needing to update crippled socioeconomic systems. And so here are some potential causes of neophobia and status quo bias. Risk aversion, regret avoidance, transactional costs, and psychological commitment or a learning curve. Here's an example of neophobia at its finest in, in history. This is from uh, an article called Enhancing Humanity written by a professor, Raymond Tallis. Quote, in Victorian times, it was anticipated that going through a dark tunnel in a train at high speed, 30 miles per hour, would be such a shocking experience that people would come out the other side irreversibly damaged. 
So this was an actual fear of travel by rail. So this is what you're working with. And, and so when I say adjust your expectation, just know that it's, a nat it's natural, a natural part of, of humans, a part of our evolution even, you know, to be skeptical of new things because they may not be good for us. Knowing this challenge, how can we enhance our communication strategy to be more effective? And to answer this question, we can look to other information about human behavior for clues. So I'm going to ask you this. Can you guess the most addictive human behavior? No, it's not cigarette smoking. It's not eating sweets. Although breathing's a good one, I don't think it made the list. Drinking coffee, no. It came close. We know Shar's vote. <clears throat> Being right. Being right. Okay, so there, there was no formal study per se. It was more of an informal survey of a few close friends, but I think the results have merit in this conversation. And I'll actually dare you to prove me wrong. So stay with me because this is leading us into part two, which is, yes, I need to keep hitting the right side of that. Part two is adopt the quality of brilliant. Didn't you know you could do this? As many of you know, um, this is something that is desirable, adopting the quality of brilliant. And so let's think about what that's actually comprised of. Maybe this is something you've heard or perhaps said about someone, an author or a speaker that you have thought was brilliant. This guy or gal is saying some of the same things I've been telling people for years. He or she puts it all together so well. He or she is therefore brilliant. Do you see the connection? <laughs> right? So if you were to go, go to that in your mind, you might have even th said that about Peter Joseph, as I know many of you here have been, are perhaps here as a result of watching his movies. I hear this said about him all the time. I had this thought about him at the time. Um, so it, basically it comes down to this. It really feels good to be right. And we tend to listen to, to people who make us right, basically, who validate an aspect of our existing view of the world. So I want to talk about belief systems, our, our view of the world, belief systems as a worldview, and this is sort of a map, and note, the map is not the territory, um, famously. Since we're born, we begin developing our worldview, how the world works, what our relationships to the world is. And in order for us to first learn something new, we need to have some orientation of the new idea to our current worldview or reference. A wise friend once told me that he'd heard that the ultimate sign of intelligence in a person was having the ability to honestly try on another person's worldview, a different opposing view, temporarily, without any fear of an obligation to take it on as his own. So just trying it on and seeing how that person thinks. So I want you to imagine how the effort of trying on the worldview of others can contribute to your communication. So how can you adopt this quality of brilliance? Well, you can set out to make someone right instead of make them wrong and try to start out with agreement. And you do this by finding and acknowledging shared values within their existing worldview. And why does this work? Because it gives us those good feelings. It gives that person a sense of, wow, this person's does, does have some good points on this particular aspect. Some keys to natural brilliance are that you really need to be a good listener in a conversation with someone so that you can learn what their worldview is, find out what's important to them. And you want to find areas of authentic agreement and then contribute authentic agreement to the conversation. And basically, I mean, that authentic piece of it's important because I know when somebody's being fake with me just as much as I'm sure you do, if somebody's just trying to be manipulative. And there's no need to in this case. We're talking about things that people 
have shared values in regard to, um, there is common ground to be found. So you, all you have to do is find where the authentic common ground is. So I want to review some shared values that you're going to find. This is in a, a resource-based economic model, what we're advocating, what we desire, and also if you listen to a lot of other people and what they're looking for, it's basically the same thing in one form or another. And if not all of these things, some of these things. So human equality, efficiency or st sustainability, scientific proof or evidence, health and well-being, and freedom for a personal contribution. And let's see, to, just as a rem reminder, a refresher, let's quickly review the characteristics of a resource-based economic model, which are no money or market system, the automation of labor, technological unification of Earth via a systems approach, access over property, so basically having access to resources versus having to own them, self-contained or localized city and production systems, and science as the methodology for governance. So that's basically you know, what you are, would be leading to in a communication after you start with an agreement from a shared value. And we're going to move to part three. And then I'm going to sort of give some examples of how all this fits into a conversation. Comparing a resource-based economy concept to an existing or familiar concept. And this is challenging because it's, it is hard to find where in our current system there are, are things to tap into that people can relate to. So I'll give you a few examples. The reason that the fish or sea animals don't eat each other at the New England Aquarium. And this, is, this aquarium is a four-story coral reef exhibit that includes over 600 sea animals. And I was there visiting uh, a little over a year ago. And a child asked a, this question of the aquarium staff, why don't the fish and sea animals that would normally be eating each other in the ocean do this in the tank? And how do you maintain your stock in, for this? Or the fish? Answer was that the reason is they have modified their behavior is because the aquarium staff is diligent to ensure that all of the species are well-fed food that they are satisfied with. And since they're already taken care of in this way, there's no need for them to feed on each other. They can now swim side by side without a problem. So do you think fish are smarter than humans would be in a similar scenario? Just something to, to think about. That was the human nature uh, argument. Or this one. I, f I personally find more freedom in not owning my own shopping cart you know, than I would trying to lug it to the store with every trip. You know, we can start to realize that we already accept sharing property as a freedom in certain present day contexts. So that makes it easier to consider that an idea could be expanded upon with an improved outcome. So then you might think, well, you know, are there other ways in which this might be useful, that we would be sharing resources where we need them and not needing to own them? Not, you know, that there's actually more freedom in that concept. And we embrace that. I don't know anybody that would say, no, I have to have my own shopping cart. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, you know, so food for thought. Also, ch children offer a great example of how humans might behave when they aren't required to have jobs. Notice they don't usually have much paperwork represented in their play. And there was probably no call to the insurance company to check coverage details. We can learn so much from little people. But they do, they do play to be helpful with each other, and, and it is a sense of work, except it's work that they're enjoying. You know, they would love to be doing that for real. It's an adult thing to do. Um, but it's not something, you know, their kids aren't, they're playing. I don't know how many people's kids just sit around and watch football all day long, and they never leave the house. 
at this age, although maybe that would be more convenient for some parents, no, they're pretty active. So I think they offer a good example when people say, but, you know, isn't everybody going to be lazy if there aren't any jobs? Part four is to make use of the Socratic method, AKA, otherwise known as, ask questions and really listen for the answers. Asking questions encourages critical thinking on the part of both parties. But in order to really be effective, you need to actively listen for the answers to questions and then formulate a new response based on those answers instead of just waiting for your turn to speak. So in order to kind of illustrate these, I'm going to give you some examples of communication exchanges based on real things that have come up of, of people who, after you sort of introduce the concept of a resource-based economy, or maybe they just watched one of Peter's films, they have different kinds of reactions to them. So I'll give you some examples. You know, won't everyone be just as lazy in a resource-based economy? So you ask yourself, what are the shared values or concerns behind this response? And that's really what you want to look for. Human equality. It would be unfair for some people to do, be doing work um, or, you know, or not contributing and just benefiting. I think that's kind of the view, so that human equality. And also, that plays into sustainability. If everybody was just lazy in an RBE, like, you know, what would really get done? What would really happen? Would that be any place I'd want to live? And of course, you here are people that already get this, but this is just trying to tap into how you might respond to this in a way that's tapping into those shared values. So you might, again, I suggest response, a response that includes the shared value acknowledged and starting with agreement. I agree, in order for this new system to sustain itself, you can't have one group benefiting over another group. It has to be a fair system where everyone is reaping equal benefits. And what I actually like about an RBE model is that the issue of equality is addressed in the design. The idea is to reduce human labor using an efficient system de of design and technology so that the necessary jobs that no one enjoys become completely automated. And this leaves jobs that people enjoy, like teaching, creating art, creating music, developing technology, gardening, work that most would not require a rigid, you know, stressful schedule, or that could be shared in shifts, perhaps, with others to allow for family and social time. And then I would pose a question. Do you feel that in that scenario, people would still choose to lay around instead of making a pleasurable contribution? So that's just one example of how to approach that particular uh, person to open up the conversation. Another one is, but technology hasn't improved life, it's made things worse. So I like to think of what might be the shared concerns or values behind this kind of a response. Well-being, because we know that technology today replaces jobs which are tied to income which causes people to have a lower standard of living. So there is a concern for well-being underlying that statement um, and making up personal contribution. Also, it may be when they say it's made things worse, um, you know, the evils that technology is used for, such as in warfare. So a response might be, I agree there's a lot of technology in existence today that does more harm than good. Military weapons are a prime example, in addition to machines stealing jobs from humans and thus taking away needed income. However, in a resource-based economic model, the need for weapons to secure land or resources becomes obsolete. Technology um, for these purposes would be obsolete. And since humans would no longer need to work to earn money in order to live comfortably, I think in those circumstances, we'd welcome the machines to do the labor that we don't enjoy or that isn't safe. And then imagine what good things could be done by machines if no money, if or money wasn't in existence, or money is no object. Also, to give 
a current example, if you're tying it into an example of where technology can be used for really amazing things, technicians are already in the process of perfecting technology that allows for the printing of vital human organs, such as kidneys. And that's just one example. But, you know, that, it, it took a tremendous advancement to get there in, in technology. So do we really want to all lump it into evil and bad? So these are some things that you can bring up in that conversation. As a Christian, I think we need to take into account God's will as a response. So the shared values or concepts behind this response. Um, could be human equality, could be well-being. As you're talking to the person, you can kind of get what that means to them. And so here's one way that you might approach it. Jesus is a great example of an advocate for a resource-based model, uh, based economic model per scriptures. So, uh, for example, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Matthew 25:35. Note he, note that he doesn't say you gave me a great competitive discount on these things. So it is within. He also multiplied the fishes and the loaves at that one event, which sort of makes me think he dig the whole post-scarcity aspect of it. Eliminating poverty and allowing multitudes of people to have free access to food, shelter, and health care. In fact, the only time he really gets angry that I recall is when he kicks the money changers out of the temple. And then you pose a question, so what do you think he would say about it in that framework? And I think you'd be surprised that they may be a little bit more open to other dis further discussion on it. Next. We need to embrace a true free market and individual sovereignty, and things will improve if we do this. So some shared values and concerns behind this response. If, if it's someone is saying, no, we really need to see what the true market has to offer and focus on that. Um, this is more the anarcho-capitalist or libertarian response. And I know it well, because I used to be in that vein. Um, human equality is definitely in there as, as an underlying attribute that they're seeking. Freedom of personal contribution is definitely something that they're seeking in this response and it's something that is a shared value of a resource-based economy response i also greatly value individual freedom and also agree that a well-designed system will negate the need for laws that unnecessarily restrict freedom these are actually among the very reasons i support moving to a global resource-based economic model we are technically capable of moving to a system that would remove the reward for crime and bump everyone up to a high quality of living, allowing for more freedom than most have in a monetary system, where we have to have money in order to make money, and we become enslaved to labor through debt to survive. So I'd be thrilled to have only natural laws to answer to and an inherent freedom to pursue my passions in tandem with contributing to an overall healthy environment. So those values are definitely there and represented. The very thing that they are concerned about is, is uh, acknowledged in the design of, of what we advocate. Okay, here's the other piece of it. You have to know when to walk away. Walk away when the person, and this is what they look like to us when they're acting this way anyway, I think is not asking any questions, they're just making statements. They're asking questions, but they don't appear interested in sincere responses. In other words, they really aren't interested uh, in what you have to say, or they're attempting to insult you. There's no need to continue the conversation at that point. Uh, we're not trying to be evangelists. In fact, basically, the best that you can do with what we're trying to do as a movement is to sow seeds. And basically, as you're sowing seeds, and all that is is just introducing it, not even seeking a agreement from that person, but just getting the information to them, having them think about it for a second or two. And as biosocial pressures rise and more and more people look for a different solution, 
a more comprehensive solution to today's problems, interest in this train of thought is likely to grow and grow. In part six, always maintain a sense of humor. So I wanted to end on this example because it's one that always gives me a chuckle. I can't support this RBE model until I see the hard evidence that it works. Where are the peer-reviewed papers? I've actually gotten this one. And I know a few other people that have. So the shared values or concerns behind this response seems to be pretty obvious. I mean, the scientific proof. So in response, I may say, I am also a huge fan of the scientific method. In fact, if you were to create a movement advocating a socioeconomic paradigm where the scientific method is the very methodology that determines what ideas and innovations are implemented immediately to produce the desired outcome, and which ones go back to the drawing board for reworking and revision, what might you call that socioeconomic movement? We happen to call it the Zeitgeist Movement. Yeah. Thank you.